Uh, welcome. I'm Marjorie Siegel. I'm the chair of the Department of Curriculum and Teaching, and I am so delighted that you could be here to help us honor Professor Karin Zumwalt and the significant contributions she has made to the fields of curriculum, teacher education, to the contribution she's made to the lives and careers of generations of students in the Department of Curriculum and Teaching, some of whom are here today, which is just great, her contributions to the college, and to those of us who've been privileged to be her colleagues for all of these years. I'm going to leave most of the talking to our wonderful panel, um, but before I introduce our distinguished panel, I'd like to thank a few people who made this event possible. Um, so first, I'd like to thank Trish McNichols and Brandon Glasser from the College Events Planning. And most of all, I'd like to thank Alicia Arthur and Felicia Smart-Williams from um, staff in curriculum and teaching who took care of all the details um, and put a lot of heart and soul into this. So thank you to everyone. So, I wanted to have an event to celebrate not just all the things Karin had done for the department and the, and, the, and the college, but the contribution she made to scholarship. She has been a leader in the field for a long time and has been ahead of the issues and arguments for a long time, as I think you'll hear as the panelists um, share their reflections and thoughts and interpretations of her work. Um, and when I put the panel together, I certainly wanted to bring together students who had been influenced by her, as well as current colleagues, as well as people beyond Teachers College who had both contributed and also uh, been shaped by Karin's work. So it's a great pleasure for me now to introduce the panel members. I'm going to begin with Dr. John Snyder. Uh, who was one of Karin's students here in the Department of Curriculum and Teaching, and he's now the Dean of the College of Bank Street College of Education. Uh, I'm also pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Robinson. Jennifer is also an alumna of uh, the Department of Curriculum and Teaching, and she is the director of the Center of Pedagogy at Montclair State University. And because that's an unusual institution, I want to say just a word about what the Center of Pedagogy is, and I'll just read a brief description. The Center of Pedagogy is a formal structure in which faculty from arts and sciences, education, and the public schools are equally involved in the ongoing work of teacher education. Anyone who is involved in the education of educators is a member of the Center of Pedagogy, and I just think that is so symbolic of what Karin has represented in all these years, so thank you, Jennifer for being here and representing. It's also a great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Danny Friedrich, Professor Danny Friedrich, an assistant professor in the Department of Curriculum and Teaching, where he has had a huge impact in a very short amount of time. So thank you, Danny, for being here. And last, but certainly not least, is a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Marilyn Cochran Smith, who is the Cawthorn Professor of Teacher Education for Urban Schools in the Lynch School of Education at Boston College in in Boston, of course, actually in Chestnut, in Chestnut Hill, right, Marilyn? Yes. Marilyn is the former president of the American Educational Research Association, the author of numerous important articles that have shaped teacher education thinking. I knew her in her earlier instantiation as a literacy educator and her important book, The Making of a Reader. And uh, so, but Marilyn went on to take on the questions and issues and problems of teacher education and has done so with such um, a huge impact and, and insight. So we're really delighted that, Marilyn, that you could be here today. I was first approached to speak today. Uh, I have to say, I thought, this, no problem. Um, I'll go with the, uh, the ever popular M and G approach. Uh, M and G is short for mush and gush. <laughs> uh, and it's uh, certainly easy for me to mush and gush about car, who among so many other things has taught me how to write everything from a dissertation uh, to a family holiday letter. She <laughs> <laughs> probably did not do a good job on the holiday letter because I've only ever written one in each of the situations. But most seriously, Karen, along with some other people in this room, are really one of three or four people who deserve to better down our lane for the kind of educator that I continue to hope to become and for the hope for the true statement that I continue to become an educator as opposed to becoming one of long time ago and ceasing to grow. What Karin wrote about beginning teachers, I think, applies to beginning teacher educators as well. 
the line with the not close teacher educators about my heart. She wrote, too often beginning teachers see no relation between what they learn in the college classroom and what they do on the job. One might attribute some of the sentiment for lack of experience, not much familiarity with the phenomenon, to realize what is and is not useful. But some of it is related to an emphasis on learning how to teach rather than learning from teaching. Unfortunately for my MG plans, however, Marjorie was adamant that we were not to go that way. So while <laughs> difficult, I will try to follow directions, which is very rare, <laughs> and talk about arguments and perspectives, scholarly contributions, that Carr's work has brought to me and to the field more generally. I'm going to use teachers and mothers facing new beginnings. Uh, for the bulk of my examples, that's from 1984. I couldn't use any of our other writings, but I chose this one for two reasons. One is personal. I was a new father and a new teacher educator when I first met Carr and had most of my interactions with her, and for a professional reason. That was written nearly 30 years ago, uh, as they say in the, in the news account. He can have it today, he can it reads remarkably great. I think one of Carr's great contributions has been a capacity, and this is why you should never use a thesaurus, to melt, fuse, merge, weave, and <laughs> Traditionally, false dichotomies, contradiction, and irreconcilable differences. I will just talk about three instances of this remarkable synthetic capacity that she possesses. The first is reconciling the false distinction between the intellectual and the personal. She does this both in what she writes about and how she writes about it. For instance, in Young Mothers, Young Teachers, the topic itself, most the personal, meaning a young mother, and the intellectual, the professional experience of beginning teachers and how to support them. But she also knows them in the writing, from teachers and mothers. One needs to come to terms with the fact that there is no one right way in teaching or in mothering, that the right way evolves as one applies a good dose of personality, intuition, common sense, past experience, and values, along with the accumulated knowledge and skill offered by the professionals. When I first arrived at Teachers College, Carr had a mug on her desk, and it said something like this, and if I misquote it, someone to correct me. A woman has to do twice as much to be considered half as good as a man. As you might imagine, I'm a man. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't really take to that saying right away. But over time, as I sat uh, and looked at that, as she taught me how to teach her, right, become an adult, I interpreted, I was messing and gushing, so I, mean, <laughs> I, I interpreted that comment to be about this melding of the intellectual and the personal. If one chooses to go this way, then one really does have to be twice as rigorous, which of course means different and rigid like rigor mortis, uh, but also analytic and empirical. That's partially because the personal is not high status research, but it's also because the personal all too often doesn't rise above cycle matter. Carnes' work in this area has always been at least twice as good. The second is reconciling the generalized, generalized child or curriculum or any object of study with the individual child or curriculum or any object of study. The importance of understanding and acting within this difference is exemplified in the conversation I had with a beginning teacher after my lesson uh, I observed that did not go as planned. She thought it was a disaster. In tears, she said, he hadn't read the book. What she meant was that the child in question, who played a key role in disrupting the entire lesson, didn't act like the book we had read and studied together in a teacher education program said he was supposed to act. <laughs> Carnes says it like this. This technological view of teaching, underlying many competency-based teacher education programs, fails to capture the educational dynamics and demands that face the new teacher. A more inclusive view sees teaching, like mothering, as a dynamic, deliberative process. Teaching entails applying the basic tools of the trade, one's experience, intuition, and understanding of particular learners' context and subject matter, in what is essentially a fast-paced, continuous, complex, problem-solving and decision-making process. The similarity between beginning teaching and beginning mothering accentuates the value of deliberative rather than a technological orientation for teaching. Teaching and mothering involve much more than application of scientific theory and technique to instrumental problems of practice. The knowledge does not point to the one right way, but awareness of it helps one decide which are the better ways in certain circumstances given certain goals. And it is a knowledge of ends as well as means, for both means and ends 
I define interactively as a teacher frames a problematic situation. The third is reconciling teaching and scholarship. Teaching is scholarship, and scholarship is teaching everywhere. They are twin sons of different mothers. Both are about growing knowledge in the mind of the individual reader learner and in the social collection of the community. In her case, the profession of teaching and teacher education. There are a handful of scholars who get this and a thimbleful who can actually do it. Car <laughs> is the cream of the top of that thimble. The curriculum, the curriculum implementation chapter that she Fran and I wrote provides an example here. First of all, I call this the coin flip article because while I was clear that the junior member of the writing group, Bill Jackson, did not come to a second year graduate student teacher's college to write a chapter in the handbook. Um, <laughs> and had he known that he certainly wouldn't have. Karin and Fran proposed that the order of the authors be determined by coin flip. And I have to say to this day, I think they're written coin flip. <laughs> anyway, the article is certainly a piece of fine scholarship conceptualizes the research and curriculum implementation in the three broad areas and offers a full review of that research. The teaching element shows up in that each of the three areas are fully and respectfully explained, including pros and cons, what they can and cannot explain from each of those perspectives. It's an example of research scholarship as teaching as opposed to proving one's ideological previous position. So, long as that important then, who cares now? Um, as Harry Pass and I used to say, so what? <laughs> is this still relevant? My answer is now more than ever. The multiple threads of distinction that are in reason with single blanket of scholarship are useful for analytical purposes, but when they become out of balance, let alone with one thread becomes the entirety of scholarship, research, and more importantly, children suffer. Educational research is not exempt from the malaise that we see in the headlines daily in the halls of government from D.C. to the state out to the mayor's office. Today, when research is often a purely solely political act, the notion of respectful teaching as a central high-quality scholarship is more important than ever. The personal can and must be public if our profession is to meet its multiple noble aims. In fact, if we can't do so, we will fail. We must make who we are and what we do visible. Once it is visible, it becomes shareable. Once shareable, it becomes improvable. In order for the profession, the generalized object of study, and the individual teacher to be able to, in their words, learn from teaching rather than learning how to teach, improvability and eternal capacity for growth and development is essential. The importance of this line of argumentation is probably even more important today than when Karin first began writing about it. When five minute video clips of one right teaching behavior where all children become the norm for the growth and development of teachers, now more than ever, we need many, many more scholars to learn from the teaching that is Carr and scholarship. Aside from my own letter, her own writing from nearly 30 years ago speaks to its own relevance. Doing a better job of this seems critical at this point when teaching is having difficulty attracting the most able college graduates, the reports of burned out and more alive teachers flood the public press, and experienced teachers are leaving or said they wish they could leave the profession. Yesterday's headline in the public post <coughs> teacher morale is the lowest it's been in 30 years. Without a doubt, she continues, the intrinsic rewards can be incredibly satisfying. It can be demoralizing to realize how little the world values a mother's job, or in Lord's words, how the real regard for teachers never matches the professed regard. The messages are conflicting. Although the work is not that important, if anything goes wrong, it is the fault of the teacher or the mother. More guys should watch. <laughs> Anna ends the article um, with a quote from T.S. Eliot. In the beginning is my end. I'd like to turn that around and include in my remarks. In the end of Karen's part, tenure at TC is our continuing beginning. First of all, congratulations, Karen, on your retirement. May you and your family enjoy this time of life more than ever. And many thanks to the committee um, for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's an honor, and I'm thankful not only to have this special time to pay tribute to Karin's work and legacy, but also to reflect on my own development as a teacher educator. So I begin. 
Approaching his waning years, wise King Solomon bemoans the notion of retirement. In the biblical book Ecclesiastes, which is also translated the teacher, Solomon is skeptical about life and uses acerbic wit to catch our attention with stark honesty about effort and a search for the meaning of life. He states, I hated everything I accomplished and accumulated on this earth. I can't take it with me. No, I have to leave it to whoever comes after me. Whether they're worthy or worthless and who's to tell, they'll take over the earthly results of my intense thinking and hard work. Smoke. He goes on to say, What's the point of working your fingers to the bone if you hand over what you worked for to someone who never lifted a finger for it? Smoke. That's what it is. So what do you get from a life of hard labor? Now, Karen, I know you don't feel that way. (laughs) But his words do make me think. What did it all matter? I selected, with Marjorie's help, two articles to discuss today. The first, Individualization, the Subversion of Elementary Schooling, which was written just as I was completing my first year of teaching. The other, the master-teacher concept, was written just after I arrived at TC as a graduate student some eight years later. By the way, I had not read either of these articles before, so reading them these many years later, I wondered whether your passions and thoughts had made their way into the fiber of my learning while at TC. Second, I wondered what relevance those articles might have in today's education milieu. I immediately heard your voice, or perhaps it hearkened me back to the 80s. What I remember about my beginning TC days was the discussion surrounding the Carnegie and Holmes reports. This was the first time I had heard talk of teachers as leaders and decision makers. These reports came as a breath of fresh air and were in stark contrast to the critics of education at that time who cried for longer school days and merit pay for productive teachers, higher standards for students and teachers, more discipline, Today, as we observed recently in our research on teacher education doctoral class, despite professionalization, the pendulum seems to have swung back in that old direction. Our critics with deep pockets and the will and power call for common core standards, teacher evaluation, deregulation, and free market teacher preparation, extended school day, and No additional pay for anything teachers do to make their students' lives better. See how the neoliberals have co-opted our language, calling us traditionalists and themselves reformers. But is that because we've remained in the ivory tower instead of, as you implored, Karin, entering the public dialogue in an effective manner, albeit difficult, as you admit? There are certainly many of us, some represented on this panel, who have spoken up loudly. But perhaps too many of us have chosen silence or been muted, unable to find our voices or the words that will quiet the likes of our detractors. Karin, you directed us to speak at local and state levels to influence that design and definition of master teacher plans so that we could have a say about what constitutes master in the education world but also cautioned us that the realities of the academy, not supporting or rewarding such activity would bog us down and prevent us from taking action early and often. What attention. But now teacher education itself is on the chopping block and who will save us? In examining the elementary schooling piece, I invited my graduate assistant, Becca, to join me in thinking about the concerns you had about the rise of uniformity in elementary schools in the New York area. Becca is a bright young woman who will soon receive a dual elementary SPED teacher certification at Montclair State. She's now interning in one of our partner schools, departmentalized and block scheduled fourth grade language arts where individualization might be common practice. I'm encouraging her to enter a doctoral program as I see the seeds of leadership in her. 
Unpretentious and thoughtful, she's just the type of student who would flourish and blossom as she has so much to offer children and the field of education. Karen, if you recall, your concern and caution were the loss of colorful, vital, and different schools that flourished in the 60s. In the late 70s, when the article was written, we were unfortunately headed toward prescription, prescriptive curriculum and widespread adoption of individualized instruction. The article also discussed meeting the needs of the individual child through teacher-proof materials at the expense of the teacher's ability to be the curriculum maker. As one would expect, there are parts of the article that resonate and others that differ from Becca's experience now. For example, you wrote, individualized instruction often represents a mismatch between instructional methods, goals, content, and materials. Surprised at the lack of attention to some recognized educational practices. Becca responds, in the short time I've been in my fourth grade language arts classroom, I've seen very little individualized instruction and almost entirely whole class instruction. Several children with special needs are pulled out at certain times throughout the hour and a half long period to meet with specialists. Even then, most of the time, the children who require this more individualized instruction do so in small groups with the other students who need it, as opposed to being entirely one-on-one. -on -one. Another observation, where you wrote, Karen, science and social studies have almost been squeezed out of the elementary school curriculum. Science, when there is time for it, has deteriorated into planting, planting, more planting, <laughs> or a series of ditto sheets designed for children to move through topics at their own rate. Becca observes, true. At my school, instruction time for both math and reading language arts classes is an hour and a half long, while science social studies is condensed into one class of the same length. My teacher mentioned to me that the children rarely conduct experiments in their science class, maybe due to class time being shared with social studies, which leads me to believe that the idea of worksheets and learning from a textbook for this subject, as mentioned in the article, is accurate. Now I look forward to spending more time with Becca thinking with her about some of her observations. We've been emailing each other back and forth about this. I want to challenge her to consider whether sh what she is experiencing is indeed great education for children and inspire her somehow to develop a deliberative approach to her teaching. One final example of Becca's reflections on the article serves as a segue to my comments on the next article. You wrote, Karen, the teacher-proof materials have eliminated the teacher as curriculum maker and have decreased the teacher's ability to adopt her instructional program to her individual pupils. Becca observes, I don't believe this is true in my classroom. The teacher follows the teacher's college writing workshop program while also incorporating her own successful writing, reading strategies like the book chat cycles that foster social interaction among students. The teacher often varies the types of writing projects she does or changes the actual lessons to teach the same content but in a way that also incorporates the student's interests. I'm heartened to think that Becca not only sees her cooperating teacher as deliberative, but that she herself is learning to be a deliberative teacher through her intern experience. In fact, if there's anything that I took from my time with you, Karen, it is the deliberation orientation to teaching. One that calls for, and John just said it, not just pedagogical knowledge and skills, but a sophisticated integration of one's experience, intuition, and understanding of particular learners and content in a fast-paced, continuous, complex, problem-solving, and decision-making process. Which leads me to the power of the article entitled The Master Teacher Concept, Implications for Teacher Educators. First, the piece is almost prophetic in its tone and clarion in its call to teacher educators. In 1985, Karen, you spoke of the major implications for teacher educators as getting themselves involved in the present public dialogue. You wrote, if we adopt a wait and see position, we may not only miss an opportunity, but permit changes that challenge our present central position in the preparation and continuing education of teachers. 
You implored teacher educators to inform state departments of education by influencing master teacher plans at that time, a noble thought, a desperate need today. Despite our many trips to the New Jersey State Department of Education, sometimes two, sometimes three times a week, and we have the ears of the Education and Human Services Commissioners and the Secretary of Higher Education, our endeavors to positively affect decisions in a neoliberal liberal milieu are an uphill battle, and I'm sure you felt that way here in New York State. Yet I do not want to think there is no hope, otherwise Solomon's claims might prove final and fatal. In the article, Karin, you wrote about the need for teacher educators to join with school teachers to combat the insufficient amount of reinforcement, recognition, and respect and the technological orientation to teaching that is redefining teaching and restricts teachers' autonomy. And we are attempting to do what you exhort through our school university partnership of nearly 30 school districts comprised of teachers and administrators. Just this week, we hosted a conversation in which arts and sciences, education, and school faculty grappled with the challenges of engaging teacher candidates and their school-based experienced teacher mentors in problem solving and a process of renewal around bringing critical thinking back into our classrooms. In contrast to reform, renewal is continuous, cyclical, and it aids in sustaining by keeping the good and building upon it. And so the teachers who participate in our network see themselves as self-renewing, whether they're called master teachers or not. They engage in teacher-led study groups, action research teams, and scholarly seminars to think and learn along with our faculty in the arts and sciences and education. They continue to be ravaged by the oppression of new teacher evaluation systems that require them to be evaluated in part by their students' standardized test scores, and I'm not opposed to teachers being responsible. But they are also bashed and bashing from the governor, who will no doubt win his reelection by a landslide. In many ways, they are the master teachers you call for in your article, Karin, who have a commitment to reflection and growth, who are becoming master deliberators about teaching, curriculum management, organization, and interpersonal relationships. I know that, is what, ha that what is happening at Montclair is not unique, but it is rare. I also know that these practices, though widespread in some district, are still not common or the norm, especially in our urban partner schools. As you indicate in the article, teachers find themselves thrust more and more into a, what was called then, technological, rather than a deliberative orientation to teaching and a constructive approach to curriculum. As I close, I just want to share by proxy Something that Nell Noddings recently shared when she was on our campus, which resonate with your legacy. Be responsible, not accountable. Responsibility speaks to taking ownership for professional actions and choices. Locus of control is within, and we are motivated by deep respect and appreciation for what our students bring. Therefore, we are inspired to help them define for themselves what they are good at. Accountability, on the other hand, what our critics are calling for, has its locus of control external. It can demean and weaken self-will by demanding that one reach a predetermined goal set by others. By the way, Nell Noddings told us, teacher educators and teacher candidates alike, that we should all be politically active and even subversive. Karen, you told us that the aim of teacher educators working with either pre-service or in-service teachers is to enhance teachers' deliberation about teaching. We are still at it, still doing it. King Solomon's claims notwithstanding, Karen, thank you. Thank you for laying a firm foundation for me, for the rest of us, to build upon and grow terra firma, if you ask me. Thank you for writing provocative articles that still inspire thought and response. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Karn's 1989 piece, it wasn't that old, <laughs> sorry. 
1989 piece, uh, Beginning Professional Teachers, The Need for a Curricular Vision of Teaching, starts with the following paragraph. Curriculum is one of the seemingly self-evident, commonly used terms with a variety of meanings. To many, it is something surely not worth studying in its own right. Most university professors teach without having been taught anything about curriculum. Knowing one's subject matter is obviously necessary and most often seen as sufficient. Why would one need to know anything so commonsensical as curriculum? I would argue that most of Karen's work, both in writing and during her tenure here at Teachers College, has been not only responding to that question, but mainly interrogating that seemingly commonsensical view of curriculum and pushing for what he calls a curricular vision of teaching and teacher education. The idea that teacher education should be framed within a curricular lens may sound obvious to those of you here who took Karen's courses or who are familiar with her scholarship. Unfortunately, this is not the case for the vast majority of teacher education programs out there, nor is it the direction that some of the dominating discourses in the field are leading into. The reasons for this are complex and come from a multiplicity of sources and vectors, but to begin to understand what the debate is about, I'd like to develop, delve a little deeper into Karen's ideas. As stated not only in that article, but also in the way in which she influenced my work the most. Through the syllabi that she passed on to me when I first got to Teachers College less than three years ago. The idea of infusing teacher education with a curricular vision is what grounds the evaluation of teachers as professionals and intellectuals, as opposed to mere technicians. Curriculum is the cornerstone of the complex understanding of teaching and teacher education that Karen's life work supports. It is important to know that curriculum is not seen here just as the mere textbook or document stating what one should teach or when. Neither is it only the planning of the learning experiences by states and districts. Finally, curriculum cannot be reduced to what a teacher and her students decide to do. Curriculum is all of the above and much more. It is what is planned and what is unplanned about classroom interactions. It includes what is visible and what is hidden, what is imposed and what is co-constructed. In Karen's own words, how explicit, that role, how explicit a role teachers have in determining that which is seen as worth knowing will depend on the particular school, but through a multitude of, this, of decisions about priorities, emphasis, and procedures, all teachers, either consciously or not, influence group and individual learning, or what some call the experience curriculum. And discerning curriculum in such a complex manner, and teachers as curriculum makers and not mere implementers, removes the possibility of seeing curriculum as a commonsensical notion, and forces us to interrogate our own roles as teacher educators in the efforts to take responsibility for what happens with our student teachers. There are a number of consequences that trickle down from this notion of curriculum and that are present throughout Karen's work that I would like to highlight. One, by situating teachers as curriculum makers, curriculum is not something that can be left out of the classroom. Even when teachers are extremely restricted, when they are conceived by policymakers as mere technicians, and when testing becomes the be all and end all of schooling, there is curriculum taking place. It may not be the curriculum we would like to see, but Karen's curricular vision of teaching implies the need to account for the role of everyone involved in schooling in the experiences that children are going through. There is no easy way out here. A mere critique of a particular regime won't do. Two, the curricular lens espoused by Karen's work has also the effect of making it necessary to take a broad view of teaching that cannot be reduced to any of its elements, nor can it privilege any sort of silver bullet solution to the issues of teaching and learning. This point is especially relevant in today's context and does not just speak to the efforts to condense teacher education into a few weeks of training by certain alternative paths. That would be too easy a critique for someone like Karen, wouldn't it? Karen's work is also a much needed tool to caution us against the advancement of perspectives that position the learning sciences at the center of teacher education. The idea that if we only knew more about the ways in which the brain works, or effective strategies for teaching based on psychological discoveries, teacher education would find its path towards, towards salvation, disregards the centrality of curriculum as a social, historical, and political embodied production, and once again positions teachers as mere vessels for the knowledge produced somewhere else. Three, linked to a previous point, a, curric a curricular vision of teaching and teacher education repositioned politics at the core of the discussions. Social justice, then, is not a topic to be covered 
in a multiculturalism lesson or in a course, but it's one of the pillars that is inseparable from the process of professionalizing teachers. Good teaching implies advocating for social justice, and without this political component, teaching is devoid of its main purpose. The moment that a curricular vision is taken out of the equation, teaching is turned into an apolitical task separated from any sense of responsibility or ethical accountability. Quite the political move, if you ask Karen. Four, finally, and perhaps in my opinion, the strongest feature of Karen's curricular vision of teaching and teacher education is the necessary openness of the question at the core of what teaching is all about. Looking back at the article from 1989 I referred to a few minutes ago, there are certainly some issues that would need to be revised almost 25 years later. This is not because the terminology might sound out outdated, but the changes in the discourses, sponsors, and practices surrounding contemporary teaching and teacher education would force a revision of some of the features of the curricular vision endorsed back then. Yet that is precisely what Karen's work engages us in, do in doing. A curricular vision requires of teachers and teacher educators to be true inquirers, to continuously question the basic assumptions underlying our thoughts and practices, and to take our new assumptions as contingent, as always open to new revisions and reformulations. Karen would certainly not be happy if we took her own words as the ultimate way things should be. That would be disrespectful of teachers seen as intellectuals, as political agents, and as critical curriculum makers, and would miss the point in Karen's work. So when I first got to Teachers College and Karen and I started interacting, I have to admit I was a bit intimidated. Here's the thing, Karen knows everything. <laughs> At least in regards to this institution, and to teaching, and to life. <laughs> I knew I would take over some of the courses that Karen had been teaching for a while, and having just finished my doctoral studies, it was not clear to me how I could infuse my own voice into a syllabus put together by such a well-known and knowing person. But that intimidation started to fade away once she handed me the syllabus she had used the previous year for critical perspectives in elementary education and told me to do, to do with it whatever I saw fit, to teach it as it was, to make minor adjustments, or to throw it in the garbage and start anew. However, it was not the fact that she told me this so wholeheartedly that gave me the confidence, but the fact that this was the spirit inscribed in the syllabus she had just given me. The list of readings and assessments was everything you would expect from a course taught by Karen. It was both extensive and intensive. It demanded a lot from students, that is from teachers seeking professional certification, and it trusted that they could do it. The syllabus pushed them to think in ways that got them out of their comfort zones and to question every underlying assumption they came to class with. And most importantly, it fostered the necessary curiosity to leave the field open to new, unpredictable insights and for curriculum to be resignified in every new interaction. The syllabus oh, that she, she had given me opened with this quote by Tomlinson. It is a curiosity of teaching that no two days are alike, but if we are not careful, all the days can take a deadening sameness. We must remember that we have every opportunity to transform ourselves and our practice just as we have every opportunity to stagnate, remaining the same teachers we were when we began. I really like this quote, so I left it there. But in keeping with Karen's challenge to make the syllabus my own, I added a new quote, this time by Foucault, that I think Karen would also appreciate. Curiosity is a vice that has been stigmatized in turn by Christianity, by philosophy, and even by a certain conception of science. Curiosity is seen as a futility. However, I like the word. It suggests something quite different to me. It evokes care. It evokes the care one takes for what exists and what might exist. A sharpened sense of reality, but one that is never immobilized before it. A readiness to find what surrounds us strange and odd. A certain determination to throw off a familiar, familiar ways of thought and to look at the same thing in a different way. A passion for seizing what is happening now and what is disappearing. A lack of, this, a lack of respect for the traditional hierarchies of what is important and fundamental. So, thank you, Karen, for never ceasing to care. At the risk of um, being rather irreverent, I can't resist the urge to return to the mug slogan that John <laughs> introduced to us. Here's the version of the mug I saw. A woman has to do twice as much to be considered half as good as a man. And then it said down at the bottom, unfortunately, 
or fortunately, that's usually not too difficult. So. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I, I'm delighted to be here to be part of this and really thank you, Marjorie, for uh, including me. Uh, and I'm also delighted that Marjorie planned this this way because I think it's really appropriate that we talk about Karin's work and her ideas. And so the idea of uh, each of us selecting some pieces that Karin has written is really a nice one. And I promise I'm going to do that. But like John, I'm going to say a few words first before I get to those. So I wanted to make a couple comments. One of the things I did in thinking about what to say was to look at Karin's CV because I wanted to check on a couple dates and remember a couple of citations. And in looking at her CV, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about what it means to really reflect on a CV, the course of one's life at this moment of retirement. And, and I found that fascinating. And I just want to say a couple things about that. One of the things I noticed was that Karin's first teaching job, her first real teaching job, was in the academic year 1967-1968. When I saw that date, and she was teaching at uh, Patrick Henry Junior High School in Cleveland, Ohio. Notice that was not Patrick Henry Middle School, because we didn't have middle schools then. When I saw those dates, I was immediately struck by their significance. The summer of 1967, right before Karin started teaching, was when we had race riots in this country, in Newark and Detroit, and in Plainfield, New Jersey, where I grew up. In April of 1968, during Karin's first year, it was when Martin Luther King was assassinated. In June of 1968 is when Robert Kennedy was assassinated. I didn't have to look up those dates, and I didn't have to look them up because I was a junior in high school, being just a couple of years younger than Karin. I was a junior in high school during that time, and it was a very hard time to be a high school student. And one of the things that I remember from that time is that our teachers never really helped us think about what was going on with these race riots that we even had at our school. And it was a really difficult thing for many of us. I suspect, I don't know, I wasn't there, but I suspect that it was hard to be a teacher in Cleveland during that time. And I suspect very strongly that Karen was one of the teachers who probably did help people try to think about what was happening and what it meant for them in their lives. She taught social studies and history and economics and English. And my guess is, from knowing Karen and her approach to thematic integration of curriculum, and her belief in paying attention to what's going on in the world around us, my guess is that she brought all those things together and helped her students raise questions about them. Another thing I thought as I looked at her CV was of course her enormously long record of service to Teachers College. And I won't go into detail about it, but to see all the various committees uh, the role she has played as an administrator and as a teacher and as division chair and department chair and dean and vice president um, really struck me as what a wonderful thing to do for an institution. And I, over the years, remember Karen talking about when she was dean and vice president and that group of vice presidents met and she was the only woman in that group. That's probably why she had that mug. <laughs> and she probably should have had the version I saw, but anyway, okay. <laughs> and then the third thing that struck me about her CV was also, of course, her long history of scholarship in the field. And so looking through her CV, and Marjorie and I were talking about this earlier because she had done the same thing, looking through her CV and looking at all her publications was sort of like uh, looking and reading a history of some of the issues in curriculum and teaching and teacher education. Uh, research, practice, and policy uh, over not quite 40 years. So we saw things like the birth of the Holmes Group and research universities deciding that maybe teacher education was something they ought to pay attention to. Teachers College was already doing that. Um, looking at issues about standards, the birth and development of the field of research on teaching. 
competency-based teacher education that emerged, alternate routes that emerged. And what was so interesting was that Karn was writing about all these things and critiquing all these things in a very deliberate, careful way. And I'll say more about that in just a minute. All the way along, and really in a way that was ahead of the game. So that's my first introductory point before I get to the readings. This, my second introductory point, I just want to say something about how I met Karin. And this is what I wanted to check on the syllabus. So I met Karin 26 years ago. And I, I think you'll remember this. The way I met her, I was at the University of Pennsylvania. And our dean, and this was not Susan Furman, this was several deans before Susan, uh, decided to do an evaluation of teacher education. It was broadly suspected that the motive was because he wanted to get rid of teacher education. But in order to do that, he wanted to bring in some important people from Teachers College, from Harvard, and then there was somebody from another Philadelphia institution, I can't remember which one, bring these folks in, get them to say what was wrong with teacher education, and then we wouldn't have it anymore. I have long forgotten who the other people were who came. I can't even remember the Philadelphia Institution, but I haven't forgotten Karen, who came representing Teachers College. She was the division chair. She was a tenured professor here. I will never forget the kinds of questions that she asked us about our program and the, the questions that gave us opportunities to say important things. She didn't just ask us about effectiveness. She didn't ask us about how many people were enrolled in programs, although those were important things. She asked us questions like, what are the assumptions you make about children as learners? How do you think about teaching as an activity and its political aspects? How do you work with schools? What's your view about teachers' knowledge? And how does that fit into university-generated knowledge? And of course, this really gave us a different kind of opportunity to talk about our program. And really, I think, uh, and Karen, you can tell me if it's true or not, I think when the committee decided that we had actually a pretty good program, I suspect that Karen played a major role in that. The program expanded the next year. I finally got a tenure track position, so I will be forever grateful. Um, and the very next year, we began Project Start, student teachers as researching teachers, where we put inquiry and teacher research at the center. So from that point on, uh, Karen and I were colleagues and over the years have become friends. Like John, I've kept up with her family through the annual Christmas card. We were already teasing the children about that. And we worked together on a lot of projects in AERA, AACTE, the Holmes Group. We've been on a lot of sessions together. And of course, the AERA panel, which I'll say something about in a minute. So I will turn to the work now. So it was hard to pick uh, what to focus on. I'm going to try to talk about two things, but I'm going to try to pay attention to the time as well. Um, and I want to echo John and actually all of the speakers. One of the things that is so powerful in looking back at Karin's work is how relevant it is to today. Now, I think it's partly because we've kind of gone back to the future in terms of the way we think about certain issues related to effectiveness and accountability and so on, and research. Uh, but I think it also has to do with Karin's uh, intellect and with the kinds of questions that she has raised. So one piece that I want to say a few things about and I have a special connection to this piece, and I think this is the earliest piece that anybody talked about, is from 1982, yours was from 84. Um, it, this was in the NSSE yearbook, and it was called Research on Teaching, Policy Implications for Teacher Education. This won AERA's 1983 award for interpretive scholarship. That was the first year AERA gave this award. And I think that at that point, they were still trying to figure out what that even meant. And I think that Karin's piece really laid the groundwork. This is what we mean by interpretive scholarship. It's more than a lit review. It's more than a policy brief. It's a very careful, deliberative kind of thinking about some body of work. Um, my special connection to this piece is twofold. I won the award myself many, many years later, so I feel connected in that, in that way. But also, this was the first piece of work of Karin's that I knew, and I knew the piece before I knew the person, so I feel connected to it. Um, to understand the importance of this piece, it's worth mentioning a couple of things about the context of the time, and some of this will sound like 
hmm, that sounds like today. There was an increasing focus on teachers. There was an increased feeling that if we could improve teachers, we would improve the schools. Research on teaching was being pressured to produce some results that would show improvement in the schools. Process product research had emerged and was very much uh, the dominant paradigm of research of the time. And the beginning teacher evaluation study, which depending on the color of your hair or your real hair, um, <laughs> you'll remember, um, had just come out. And there were all sorts of headlines about its findings and the most, um, the, the most fancy one had to do with time on task that all of you uh, will remember. Karin's piece, I think, was sort of a voice of reason in the midst of all of those things that were going on. The piece is heavily cited and in the sense of a masterful um, knowledge and grasp of a great deal of literature. But what's most important about it, I think, is that it's this careful, thoughtful, detailed, critical, and from my view, very persuasive analysis of how we should think about process product work and how we should think about what she referred to as descriptive research. And people have called that different things uh, over the years. What she argues in the piece is that there is wisdom in both kinds of research and that we should continue to develop these kinds of research and continue to fund them. But then she argues for what has already been talked about, a deliberative perspective on understanding teaching. And she makes the case that teacher educators use these kinds of research differently depending on their conceptions of teaching. And she compares what she called a technological approach to this more complex, deliberate understanding of teaching. And she argues not that one kind of research is better than the other, but a deliberative perspective on teaching is more worthwhile, is more accurate in relation to what the activity of teaching uh, really involves. I don't know if you convinced anybody because we're back there, but um, she also helped us think about what it means to get behind the headlines. So she talked, for example, about the beginning teacher evaluation study and its fancy headlines with time on task, including a call by Connecticut legislators that because the research said the more time on task, the better, we should expand the school day by two hours. Now, and Karen explained why that perhaps didn't make sense and perhaps was not a direct implication of that study. She also, in that article, made a very important distinction between what is based on normative issues, what is based on values, and what is based on empirical work, and tried to help people understand there's a difference. And as I said, finally, she makes the case for this deliberative orientation, which, which can use both kinds of research and is much more suited. And like all of us, I guess, I just wanted to read from uh, one paragraph from the article because, again, like John, I think we could, have, we could have this today and I wish we would have it today. She said, and, and I would invite you to think about many of the reform teacher education projects that are going on today, many of the groups that are grabbing all the headlines, and think about this in comparison to those. Rather than operate from the deficit model implied in the technological orientation, it's important to approach teacher education with the respect for the judgment of the professionals who are expected to educate our children. A teacher education program built around lists of prescriptive behavior denies the very thinking behavior that is critically important in teaching and provides a model which may be miseducative in the classroom. I think this applies perfectly today. How am I doing? Just, okay. Um, the second piece that I want to talk about um, is the work that Karen did with her then doctoral student, C.J. Craig, as part of the ARA panel on the study of teacher education uh, that Ken Zeichner and I chaired. Um, this resulted in two chapters that are in the ARA book, which is called Studying Teacher Education. It was originally going to be one chapter, 
and the research is so far-reaching, there's so much of it, and we really struggled and went back and forth many, many times about how to organize it, but eventually this became two chapters in the book, and I'm really just going to talk about the first one. I want, again, to say a couple words about the context. This work began in 2000, and at that time, surprise, surprise, there were increasing challenges to university teacher education. There were mounting questions about the knowledge base for teaching and teacher education, and whether there is one. There were major inconsistencies in the claims people were making about what the research said about teacher education. So I won't cite the authors here. So one well-known person was claiming that there were more than 200 studies that showed that teacher education was the most important factor in how effective teachers were. Another two authors coming from a different perspective, they were economists, they claimed <laughs> that there were more than 400 studies that showed that teacher education doesn't matter at all. Now, I always wondered if you were supposed to do the math and say, well, they had 400 and this other one only had 200. But the point here is that I don't think people knew what to think about what the research said. And sometimes these conflicting conclusions looked like they were even based on the same research. So it was a very confusing time. This project that we initiated was intended to try to review the weight of the evidence about teacher education and outcomes. What we did was to form a panel, and then that panel invited people who would be authors, but we all really became the panel. And the only distinction by people, between people writing the chapters and those on, only on the panel was that the chapter writers did more work because they not only participated as members of the panel, but also were writing major chapters. So, and the names, I'm just gonna mention a few of the names because you'll get a sense of, of this group and how challenging it was for Karen, I'm sure she would tell you this, and others, I wrote uh, a chapter as well, to, to have our work reviewed by all of these people. So uh, on the panel were Ken and myself, Bob Floden, Susan Furman, Drew Jatomer, Dan Fallon, Ana Maria Villegas, Jackie Irvine, and chapter writers included Karen, Pam Grossman, Suzanne Wilson, Etta Hollins, Marlene Pugash, Renee Cliff, and eventually Bob Floden wrote one of the chapters as well. All of our chapters were reviewed by all of those people in many draft forms. So this was not an easy crowd uh, to play to or to please. Karen um, was a consummate member of the panel, in my perspective. I know this is the mush and gush part. But I think that not only could we count on her always to do her homework and meet the deadlines, which, believe me, was not the case for everybody, um, but she was also, as she has been in all of her writing, and I think we've heard everybody say this, she was a careful reader, a careful thinker, very even-handed very detailed and thorough. And this was a great gift to have on the panel. Uh, her particular chapters had to do with teacher characteristics. One chapter had to do with the demographics, and the second eventual chapter had to do with the quality profile in terms of teacher characteristics. So the first chapter set out to look at questions like, who's going into teaching? Where, do, where are they prepared? Where do they teach? How long do they stay? Now, if you know anything about this body of work, you know that these are really controversial issues. They have important implications. They make their way into policy, sometimes informed by research, sometimes not. So this was a, this was a real task and a real challenge. I, I know in talking with Karin many times during the uh, period that this chapter was prepared, there was an enormous body of work to read and it had inconclusive findings. And yet in the headlines, so this is a theme going back to her earlier work, we would see the findings flash up in the headlines as if we knew things definitively. We knew, for example, that people who were going into teaching came from the bottom of the barrel of college students. That was one of the headlines at the time that we saw all the time. What Karen and, and her co-author did was to take the generalities that we were seeing all over the newspapers and 
unpack them in a very careful way. Now, it's hard to do, and it's probably hard to read, and it's not really what policymakers want, but because what she was doing was saying, look, these generalities mask a whole lot of distinctions that we are going to try to point out here. Some things are true in certain regions and not in others. Some things are true across certain areas and not in others. Some things used to be true, but they're not now. You get this kind of finding if you define retention or attrition in this way. You get this kind of finding if you ask high school seniors if they're planning to teach. Because the answer really is, it's complicated. It varies from one situation to another. But if you take the time to read this chapter, you will really get a sense of the factors like race, gender, socioeconomic status, age, and when you put those together with kind of root, alternate, or traditional, and Karn, Karn's chapter was one of the early uh, pieces that pointed out that that distinction really didn't make very much sense, and that there was actually more variation within than between. This is the kind of work that this chapter did, and I know that it was very challenging, although she didn't complain about it too much, too much. <laughs> Um, so if you haven't looked at that chapter in a long time, I would recommend go, going back and looking at it. We have some new research. So she was really working only with data that went up to about 2003, and in some cases just to 2000 because they were using NCES data and had to work with what was available. But many of the conclusions are the conclusions that we have today, and you can really get a sense of how they are not just true in every case, and if the, if the um, details have changed, the way that they made distinctions and sorted things out have not. So it's really valuable in that sense. At the end of the chapter, as in all of the chapters in the book, there's a part that says, what do we know about, and then it has the topic, what do we know about the demographic characteristics of teachers? based on the research. What don't we know? And this was an opportunity, for example, for them to say, we do not know from the, te from the research that teachers come from the bottom of the barrel, and then to make distinctions and say what it is we know and don't know. And then finally, each chapter had a part on a research agenda. What is the research that we need at this point? Um, I like to think, and I only know this anecdotally, I like to think that those research agendas uh, informed doctoral students and new researchers and have informed their work since the book was published in 2005. And I think that the, the two chapters that Con Karen and her co-author did really made a very good case and gave us a very thoughtful analysis of the kind of research we need and the things we need to unpack and think about if we really want to know about the demographic characteristics of teachers, and if we really want to know about teacher quality, and if we want to get behind the headlines, and if we want to get beyond these sort of superficial generalities that are masking important distinctions. So I, I know I told Karin this many times over the years, but I want to say publicly how grateful I am for her work on the panel as a panel member and as a chapter author uh, who was easy and pleasant and, and serious and thoughtful and fun to work with. Every time we talked about the work of the panel, uh, each time we presented it, it seemed like we said there were more years involved. So we said, this was a three-year project, and then it was, this is a four-year project. And in the end, we started work in 2000, and the book was published in 2005. So I think it was a five-year project, sort of. And the group met together in person many times over weekends at some mediocre and some not so bad hotels. But along the way, we really became good friends and colleagues. So uh, just as my fellow panel members have said, I'm sorry, I'm going on too long. Um, I am very grateful for the friend and colleague that I have had in Karn for 26 years, but as importantly, for the wonderful body of her work which I think serves as an exemplar of what it means to be a scholar 
and what it means to take other people's work and your own work seriously, and what it means to be interpretive. Not that she always was, but that was part of what she was doing. So, thank you. Thank you, panel. Let's give the panel a big round of applause. I am so glad this is being taped for all the people who are unable to attend because I'm so glad that we're going to capture um, the comments, thoughts, and perspectives that each of you brought. And I think it's a great gift to Karen to honor her in this way. So thank you very much. Um, now I'm going to turn to the honoring. I'm, I'm going to pass over the um, comments and questions because there are microphones in the reception and lots of opportunities for us to talk. But I want to now introduce um, Vice Provost Bill Baldwin, who will get us started in some formally honoring of our colleague, Karin Zumwalt. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here on behalf of uh, President Susan Furman and uh, Provost Tom James. And I'm delighted that you could all join us for this symposium. Um, it's a marvelous celebration uh, and recognition of Karin and her unparalleled record of accomplishment. Um, I feel like I've learned more in the past hour and a half than I have over the last 30 some, I was gonna say 30 some odd years. They haven't all been odd, uh, but a good number of them. I've enjoyed um, occasions when I've had to stand in for a president or a dean, um, but this one's particularly important or particularly special for me. I've been at the college, as I said, for 35 years in one capacity or another. And I've come to know just a remarkable group of faculty, staff, and students. Um, I'd be hard pressed uh, to think of somebody who's had a more profound, uh, positive impact. I could think of a few that have had a, a profound impact, uh, <clears throat> but I'm not sure the word positive uh, would be in there. Um, then Karen, uh, she has been and is uh, an extraordinary role model for me. Uh, and I know for many of uh, the others of you who are here today. Um, so it makes it uh, an even greater pleasure for me to deliver these remarks on behalf of Susan. Um, and parenthetically, what I want to say, if any of you know me, uh, you know that if there's a three pages of typewritten comments and you've given me an hour and a half, I will rewrite it. Um, these are Susan's remarks, um, so I have not rewritten them. So here we go, in all seriousness. Um, at Teachers College, Faculty are expected to demonstrate excellence across their careers um, in a number of domains, in teaching and advising, in research and scholarship, <clears throat> and in service <clears throat> to both one's institution and field. I can think of few individuals who have taken so seriously all three facets of the faculty career, as has Karin Zomo. There is hardly anyone who has been more committed to both teacher education as a field of study and to Teachers College's place in that field. 75 years ago this year, Teachers College established the country's first academic department focused on the study of curriculum and teaching. For over half of that time, Karin has been one of the primary drivers within that department. Her scholarship, as we've heard today, has tackled a range of issues that are at the center of this nation's continued struggle with what it means to teach and to prepare teachers who can teach. She has written seminal works on teacher education and on curriculum. She has long had a substantial impact on all students in the department through classic courses, including one for which she is perhaps best known, the teacher, socio-historical and cultural contexts of teaching. And she has been known in the department and beyond for mentoring doctoral students through to successful completion of their programs, including many, as we've seen today, who've gone on to extraordinary careers at all levels of education. Many at TC have gotten to know Karin, not just through her scholarship and teaching, but also through her leadership. Indeed, during her time as Dean of the College, TC was able to complete a complicated reorganization of academic departments and programs, to establish the Rita Gold Early Childhood Center, to appoint the college's first ever standing faculty committee on appointment to tenure and promotion to full professor to accomplish in ways that were consistent with our mission and our perspective, a successful reorganization, I'm sorry, a successful re-registration with New York State Education Department and the reaccreditation through NCATE of all of our teacher preparation programs. And this one I hadn't done the math on and successfully complete searches for more than 40% of the college's current faculty. 
Um, as many of you know, and okay, I am, which is Susan, I am spending much of this year, our 125th anniversary, talking about TC's legacy. Karen's, Karen's legacy is, in many ways, a mirror of the college's. Her commitment to integrating research, practice, and service is at the center of the college's mission. Karen's work has been recognized with countless awards, but one of them in particular stands out. In 1983, Karen was the very first recipient of AERA's Relating Research to Practice Award. In her 37 years at Teachers College, Karen has demonstrated an unparalleled commitment to doing just that, building on her stellar research as she has worked to ensure that teacher education is practiced as effectively as possible, and she has done so through a tireless commitment to her communities, her department, the college, and around the country. Thank you, Karen, for all that you have done for Teachers College and for teacher education. So as Bill said, we're celebrating here at Teachers College the 125th anniversary, and as Susan's remarks also indicated, the Department of Curriculum and Teaching is celebrating our 75th anniversary this year. So there is much to celebrate, but I'm especially pleased that today our celebration is to honor Karen. Now, many people wanted to be here today to share this moment and were unable to do so. So we have a series of um, events planned. So I'm going to ask that we, I never get to say this, Roland Lester.
department chair and division director, which is when I joined. My first interview appointment was with Carl Zawal, who kind of gave me a little hint that maybe I had a possibility here. <laughs> Very thumbs up. I appreciate it. Dean, she was an important, um, she was an important dean for a lot of us. I certainly earned tenure while Carl was dean, and I am always grateful for the generosity of reading my scholarship and uh, understanding. I always felt understood here in a way that I did not feel understood at some institutions. You have been our benefits guru, Karen, and I don't know what we're going to do. I was explaining to Marilyn at lunch the significance of your deliberative, careful, thoughtful, not only for your significant scholarship, but for the, 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 the impact on the lives as, as benefits are. And, and the work that you've done uh, to educate us as to the cost of our medicine every year. <laughs> <laughs> every year, Karen says, you know how to save money? And she has a little lesson plan. And, uh, and then a sheet, sheet, sheet for the faculty. Some people call me. <laughs> Karen would love with respect to oh, offer you. you. As one of my former professors, Dan Lordy, notes, teaching is marked by endemic uncertainties. Teachers are never really certain of their influence or whether it reflects their intentions. So after 37 years here at Teachers College, it is especially satisfying to hear about the means that people whom I respect, John, Jennifer, Marilyn, Danny, have made of my work as a teacher and a scholar. Thank you for taking time from your very busy lives and sharing your thoughts with me. It means an awful lot. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. I know there are many other places you would like to be on Friday afternoon. Uh, and a special thanks to Marjorie. Where did Marjorie go? Oh, Marjorie. <laughs> um, who had the idea for what one of my sisters calls a classy event. And Alicia, Felicia, and others who made it happen. As I stand here, six months away from retirement, it is not hard for me to become nostalgic. I arrived at TC during the summer of 1976 when the city was celebrating the nation's 20, 200th birthday. Having taught at Smith College for three years, I came as a 32-year-old widow, eager to start a new phase of my life. Truthfully, I came with four very clear goals. Well, they were more like behavioral objectives. <laughs> Finish my dissertation, get tenure, get married, and have a family. And not necessarily in that priority order. 
These goals had to be accomplished within the context of my new position as director of the pre-service elementary program, teaching five courses a year, supervising four student teachers six times a semester each, so 42 school visits a year, and a heavy doctoral load. In the six years prior to tenure, I completed 40 dissertations, 16 as sponsor, and 24 as second committee person. I look back on this workload with awe. <laughs> and great appreciation of the many people, staff, students, administrators, faculty colleagues, and family, who made these years and all that follow possible. As I thought about all the people I would like to thank, I realized that I would far exceed my five minutes. So in order not to offend anyone by exclusion, I decided to acknowledge three individuals who are permanently absent, Larry, Harry, and Gary. <laughs> there was no formal mentoring system at Teachers College. These three were among many who mentored me and enabled me to grow and flourish here. Yes, Larry, Harry, and Gary have something more in common than rhyming names. Unlike today, women were not the majority at Teachers College. Only 25% of the faculty were women when I came. Out of 146 faculty, there were only 19 tenured women. Larry Kremen was president of Teachers College. I remember the day that Larry stopped me in the hallway, right outside this chapel door. He told me that I was the TC type, which I took to mean someone who was a good teacher and good scholar, but just as importantly, had a commitment to the TC community. Uh, who understood the responsibilities and was not afraid to speak up. But he added that if I wanted tenure, I would have to have a Keplerian view of teacher education that was nat nationally recognized before I came up for tenure. I went home and cried. How was that possible to do in such a short time? That talk shook me, but also caused me to prioritize my professional choices including agreeing to write the chapter that Marilyn talked about, which won AERA's first Interpretive Scholarship Award in 1983. So thank you, Larry. Harry Passo was my department chair and division director for many, many years. His nickname for me made me cringe, but also very proud, Tough Tilly. <laughs> I knew when I was in trouble when he boomed, Karen, Joan Bunyans, and Kepler's Zumwalt, come here. He was the one who encouraged me to develop the course on the teacher. He was always there for me. Gary Griffin was an associate professor in the department. Since he earned more than my $14,000, he could afford to take a taxi home. So after my 9 o'clock class, instead of taking three subways, he let me hitch a ride with him. Going out of his way, he had the cab drop me off at the Roosevelt Island tram before he headed to the Upper East Side. On those rides, I learned a lot about TC and being a professor. He eventually became a dean elsewhere. When he came back to TC for a few years, I was dean, and I again, benefit, again benefited from his colleagueship and support. TC has changed a lot in, in a lot of ways. In those early years at the first class, we had to clarify the smoking rules. Smoking was determined by a majority vote, not the city of New York. Now we need to talk about texting and laptop and tablet use. <laughs> Registration was an all-day event for students and faculty rather than a computer click weeks ahead of time. We used mimeographs and dittos to make class materials and typewriters to do correspondence and dissertations. Now just imagine if a student had to make a revision on page 44, the whole dissertation had to be retyped. Uh, and we actually had to go to the library to read references. If the library, if the library didn't have it, or, so, or someone had torn out the article, which often happened, we had to wait to get it on interlibrary loan. Faculty members were here four days a week and often met for lunch, often met for lunch and coffee. Technology has made our jobs and lives easier and in some ways more demanding. While it has expanded our community, I do think it has also diminished community in some ways. Having tenure, 
I have had the security, the security that so many people do not have and the ability to reinvent myself without leaving my job. I have been at TC longer than I have lived anywhere else. While I had 14 years of adult life before coming to TC, my family has only known me as a TC employer. Employee, excuse me. <laughs> Being an architect in a large firm, Bob was surprised to learn that my seemingly flexible schedule is an illusion. <laughs> and that most of the required after-hours writing is unpaid. I wonder when it was that Christina and Scott realized that not all mothers came with the ever-present dissertation. <laughs> I remember when five-year-old Chris answered the phone one day and shouted in disbelief, Mom, this person thinks you're a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> one day, 10-year-old Scott came to work with me, school holiday, um, just before I became dean. Before we left, I stopped by for a meeting with Dean Judith Brandenburg so, she could get an idea, so he could get an idea of where I would be working. On the drive home, he was very quiet. And then he asked from the back seat, because we always had them in the back seat in those days, what does, it, what does a dean do? Well, I tried to explain in simple terms, but then the real question came. Is the dean a prostitute? <laughs> Now, I don't know if he knew something more than I did about my job, or because Gene, Dean Brandenburg didn't look like a prostitute to me. So he, I was very calm. I kept my eyes on the road. Uh, I asked him where he got that idea. He said that when he went to the men's room, right out here, opposite her office, there were three condom machines. <laughs> Now, that was news to me. <laughs> um, and it was also the fact, it was news to me that he knew what a prostitute was. <laughs> anyway, I made sure to clean that up before I became dean. My 32-year-old self, looking forward, could never have imagined my professional journey over the next 37 years. Given how long it took me to complete my own dissertation, I would not have believed that I would, have, I would complete 136 dissertations over the years with the possibility of 13 more, and 114 master's action projects with the possibility of nine more in my last eight years. I certainly could never have imagined where my writing would take me, the colleagues here and elsewhere who have enriched my life, the students who kept me learning, the staff at TC who supported me, the challenges, joys, stress, appreciation, and frustration I would face in different roles, I assumed. Not being one to just let things ride, it hasn't always been an easy journey, but overall a very satisfying one that I know will live on. So here I am, six months before retirement, with more than six months of work to finish up. That sounds usual. I think one of the reasons Marjorie may have selected this celebrate, have scheduled this celebration so early was she wanted to make sure that I got started on a really huge project that I need to complete before August 31st. Clear out my office. <laughs> Marjorie, I promise to tackle one pile next week. Thank you all. <laughs>